The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents... This is your FBI. This is your FBI. The official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Transcribed and presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. A lot of folks in our audience tonight are specially attentive because they received one of the thousands of postcards sent out yesterday by representatives of the Equitable Life Assurance Society. These postcards were invitations to hear tonight's middle commercial on this Equitable Society radio program. The commercial will tell about the Equitable's Independent Sixties Plan, a practical, workable plan for people who want their sixties to be years of complete independence. I'll be back in approximately 14 minutes to give you full information on this special plan offered by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Tonight's FBI file, The Sentimental Double Cross. Unfortunately, it is necessary for the Federal Bureau of Investigation to call to your attention the current crime wave more often than it would like to. It would much prefer that there was no crime wave to discuss, but the facts do not warrant any such conclusion. There is almost unprecedented activity among criminals, and your FBI talks about it on this official broadcast because it concerns you so directly. Every crime, no matter where it is committed, has its effect on you. It raises your tax bill. It raises the price you pay on various commodities. It makes you the next possible target for the criminal. Yes, it touches every one of you in a hundred different ways. And yet, try to recall something. In your presence, when has anyone been heard other than law enforcement officers discussing the prevention of crime rather than the sordid details? The answer probably is never. The solution is for you to bring the subject up yourself. Discuss it from every angle until you arrive at some plan whereby you can effectively aid in the war against crime. For, like international wars, this is a battle which will not be won unless you, the law-abiding, decent citizens, join together and cooperate with your local police. The time to do that is now. Tonight's file opens in a small, dimly lit room of a building located on the outskirts of a Midwestern city. It is midnight, and two men are listening to the last note of a distant clock. Frankie, that's 12 o'clock. I know. Well, let's wake him. Okay. You ready? Mm-hmm. Wake up, Tommy. Mm-hmm. He's really knocking it off. <laughs> Well, this ought to do it. Hey, uh, it's okay, Tom. It's okay. Uh, it's just us. Oh. <laughs> yeah. You know why we woke you? Oh, no. It's after midnight. Happy birthday, Tommy. Huh? Have a thousand of them, kid. Sure. Oh. <laughs> well, thanks, fellas. Uh, me and Charlie got something for you. Huh? It's not very much, but... Here. A ballpoint pen. Mm-hmm. Gee, I... I don't know what to say. Okay. Well, it was so thoughtful of you. <laughs> I'm not ordinarily at a loss for words, but... Well, I, I just can't tell you how thankful I am. Oh, forget it. Sure. That ain't the only present, Tommy. You mean there's more? Uh-huh. We got a plan all set to bust out of this jail tomorrow morning, and we're taking you with us. <laughs> Day at a nearby FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor meets Agent Bill Wayne as he is signing in. 
Hello, Bill. Hi, Jim. You back from court already? Yeah, recess. Oh, I've got to go back this afternoon. You uh, be through testifying then? Probably. Good. When you're finished, the SAC wants you to work on a case he just put me on. Oh, what's the story? A jailbreak out at South Randall. Again? Yeah. Three men got away. Two of them had been arrested by our agents for violation of the National Motor Vehicle Theft Act. How did they get out? They overpowered the jailer. That's the third time that same thing's happened out there. Yeah, I know. Well, they stole the jailer's keys and were gone by the time anybody missed them. When did all this happen? Within the past hour. Any idea what they're using for transportation? Well, I'm not sure, Bill, but there was a stolen car reported shortly after the break. Well, who are the two we're looking for? First one is named Charlie Lake. He had previously served ten years for assault with a deadly weapon. And who's his partner? Frank Robin. He served five years for armed robbery. Hmm. The third man was named Tommy Brunswick. He wasn't a hardened criminal like the others. He was in for juggling his company's books. Well, did they ever work together? Well, not from their arrest records. They were cellmates, but I believe that was the only link. Anything been done so far? Uh, we've had a roadblock set up on the two highways leading out of South Randolph. Well, I hope it was set up early enough. Well, I'm going out there now and find out, Bill. As soon as I get anything, I'll call in. <laughs> Pretty fast. Well, I want to look like a legitimate drive. Oh. Ah, this is certainly pleasant. Uh, being out of prison, I mean. It'll be more pleasant when we get to some safe place. You got that, Matt? Oh, uh, Frankie? Yeah. What's the story? This road goes another five miles. Uh-huh. Then it feeds into a lot of roads. A junction like. Where are we heading for, Charlie? Any place where there's dough and shelter. You mean you have no particular destination, Charlie? No. Then, uh, could I make a suggestion? Yeah, why? Why don't we head east? Too many towns. But you said you wanted to... Let's head west. I have some money planted. Hmm? I say I have some money hidden away, but... Of course, if it's too dangerous... Uh, important money? Oh, about $10,000. $10,000? <laughs> dollars It's from when I was borrowing money from the company I was working for. You fellas were nice enough to take me along with you. I'd be very happy to give you, say, oh, $1,000 a piece to show my gratitude. Frank, look at that map. You've changed your mind? Kid, it's a pleasure having you aboard. Where's the dough planted? It, it's in a hey, place. Hey, what? Look down at the bottom of the hill. It's a roadblock. Uh, what do we do? Let's pull off the road and sit tight a minute. They'll see us. Well, maybe not. What about the woods? Just sit a minute, will you? They'd be pretty good cover. According to the map, there's a highway that runs on the other side of them. Charlie, look there. A cop. Yeah, I think he spotted us. Yeah, he has. Come on. Hit for the woods. Special Agent Taylor speaking. Hello, Jim. This is Bill. You call me? Yeah, Bill. I'd like you to pick up something before you come down here. Any action there? Plenty. The roadblock was partially effective. What do you mean, partially? Well, the trio had to abandon their car and scatter when they got to the place where the block was set up. Oh. They made a break for it on foot through the woods. Well, what happened? Frank Auburn was recaptured, but Tommy Brunswick and Charlie Lake got away. That's not so good. Have you talked to Auburn yet? Yeah, I've just finished questioning him. Well, he told me that Tommy Brunswick was wounded by one of the local police, but Auburn didn't know how serious the wound was. Uh, anything else? Yes, he said Brunswick mentioned some money that he had hidden. He was going to give some of it to them. Did Brunswick say where he had it hidden? According to Auburn, no. Do you think he's telling the truth? Yeah, yes, I do, Bill. He, he's scared. So, uh, what do you want me to bring down, Jim? Oh, oh, yeah. Will you contact the local police and get Tommy Brunswick a arrest record? Okay. If we can get a lead from that and find out where the money is hidden, we should be able to pick up both of them. Oh, so you right there, Tommy? Uh-huh. Hold on. I'll try. Yeah, those things really burn. Yeah. Yeah. You ever been shot, Charlie? Uh-huh. By a cop? By a dame. It was a gun I gave her for a birthday. Well, we ought to be there in a couple of minutes. Who is this doctor you're taking me to? Well, kid, he ain't exactly a doc. Well, you said he was. Well, he used to be. Oh. He blew his license about five years ago. What does he do now? He drinks whiskey. Oh. 
me for a living. Well, the best he can. Well, that's that's the place up ahead. He isn't very far from the main road. Police might come by here looking for us. Oh, Doc will take care of the cops. Wait, I'll come around and help you out, Tommy. All right. Here, here. Now grab my shoulder, Tommy. Uh, there we are, kid. That's good. Sorry to be such a burden. Oh, you're kidding. Just hold on, kid. Yeah. Well, here we are. Oh, I hope he's home. Hello, Doc. Yeah. Charlie. Yeah. Charlie Lake. Well, well, it's good to see you, boy. Say, by golly, I was just thinking about you. Uh, Doc, give me a hand, will you? Yeah. Who, who's this? A pal of mine. He needs looking after. Well, come in, come in, come in. Okay. Charles, I was under the impression that you were incarcerated. Well, we bust out. <laughs> splendid, splendid. That's how my pal here got hurt. Can you fix him up? That's an elementary question. Oh, just put him on the cot, Charles. I shall prepare for immediate surgery. <laughs> Tommy, have a small sample of the juice of tender mercy. Well, is it all right for me to drink? Sure, sure, sure. Thanks. <coughs> Tommy, I'd like to talk to you. All right. It's, uh, it's about you. You know, son, there are moments on this mortal coil when a man in my profession fears to believe his own inscrutable knowledge. What do you mean? Son... The wound you received at the hands of that minion of the law was quite severe. I know. Much more severe than I at first surmised. Well, last night you said I, I was... know, I know. I said you were getting better. But it appears from the tests I took this morning that Well, Tommy, your convalescence isn't what I hoped it would be. What? You're not going to recover some. What? You mean I'm I'm gonna die? That's right, son. I can't. That is something over which mere mortals have ceased to exercise any control. There's only one thing I can do for you now. What's that? Notify your next of kin. Oh. Do you... Do you have anybody to whom you're particularly close? My sister. I shall notify her. Where are you going? I must replenish my supply of ambrosia, Tommy. Through some error, I brought with me an empty bottle. Did you tell him, Doc? Yes. Yes, Charlie, I I told him. Has he got any relatives? A sister. Sister. Well, I'll use her as a wedge to find out where he stashed the money. Oh, Doc. Hmm? You stay away from him. Why? Well, if you go in there loaded, the poor kid might find out he ain't really going to die at all. We will return in just a minute to tonight's case from the official files of your FBI. Just before tonight's exciting file... I mentioned an important announcement the Equitable Society asked me to give at this time. I urge you all to listen closely. This is a special message about the Equitable Society's famous Independent 60s plan. Independent 60s means exactly what it says. When retirement time rolls around, you're free and independent. No charity, no money worries. This Independent 60s plan enables you to be self-supporting and self-respecting. When you reach retirement age, you can live just as you like. Maybe move to a section where the climate is mild and pleasant all year long. For me, that's California, Mr. Keating. San Diego, California. My wife and I have our own little place right outside of town. And best of all, it's only a four-iron shot from a golf course. Now that I know where you spend your spare time. Would you believe it, Mr. Keating? I've been playing golf for years. Never broke a hundred in my life. But now I'm shooting in the low 90s. Well, I'm sure everybody sees the advantages of the equitable, independent 60s plan. Just what is it that keeps more people from joining? I guess they're like I was for a long time. I used to think you had to be rich to belong. How did you find out the truth? From my equitable society representative. 
He showed me with actual figures just where I stood. And it sure surprised me, finding out how much Social Security and the life insurance I already owned helped towards independent 60s. That's very true. In many thousands of cases, it takes only a slight increase in your present insurance to enable you to look forward with complete confidence to independent 60s. A few extra dollars a week did it for me. So why not see your equitable representative without delay? Phone him soon. Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Sentimental Double Cross. The situation discussed by the two special agents in tonight's case from the files of your FBI, the situation which sees a small-town prison fail to hold its prisoners time and again, is not a caricature of the true facts. That state of affairs does exist today in many parts of the country. It often happens that a criminal is arrested after much time and effort. He is tried in court at further expense of the taxpayers, and he is convicted. He is then sentenced to one of these cracker-barrel jails... And within a short time, he escapes. Now the entire costly process has to be gone through again. Gone through, of course, at your expense. But the situation is not hopeless. There is a solution, and it is available to every community. Build better jails. No one of you citizens listening tonight can do that by yourself. But you do have a vote. And you can speak your mind through the ballot box when the question is brought before you next election time. Unfortunately, there were many such referendums to build new and more secure prisons defeated the last time the people went to the polls. Defeated because of a theory of false economy. You do not save money by letting prisoners escape and having to recapture them. You save money by making sure that any criminal sentenced to a term in prison will serve that term. Any other policy is penny-wise and dollar-foolish and favors not you, but your enemy, the common enemy, the criminal. Tonight's file continues in a room at the South Randolph Local Police Headquarters. Sorry it took me so long to drive down here, Jim. Oh, that's all right, Jim. I was held up by those roadblocks. Well, apparently Brunswick and Lake weren't. Oh? Yeah, you remember my telling you they ran through the woods when they abandoned that first stolen car? Uh-huh. Well, there's another highway on the other side of those woods. They stole a second car over there. How do you know? Well, we found the jacket from Brunswick prison uniform right where the car had been parked. Mm. Have we got a description of the second stolen car? Yeah, we've already sent out an alarm on it. Have all the doctors in this vicinity been notified about Brunswick's wound? Yeah, that's too well. Yeah, I don't suppose there's anything else that can be done, Jim. No, nothing that I can think of. Oh, we might just as well start studying that arrest record of Brunswick. Oh, yeah, it's right here in this envelope. Oh, pardon me, Jim. Yeah, sure, Jim. Special Agent Taylor speaking. This is Sergeant Crawford. Yes, Sergeant. We just got some word on that alarm. On the car? Yes, a man said he heard the alarm on the radio and remembered seeing the car go past his house about an hour ago. Now, where does he live? On a side road off the main highway, about nine miles out of town. Where does that road lead to, Sergeant? Well, it's a dead end. The only house further in than the one this man lives in is a small two-room shack. Mm, who lives there? Gone old drunk. He used to be a doctor. Uh, Sergeant, I think we'd all better get out there right away. <laughs> Sergeant has men deployed all around the house. I hope they keep low. They might have as much ammunition in that house as we've got out here. Yeah, I know. I guess this portable mic is live now, huh, Bill? Yeah. Well, we'll give it a go. Brunswick and Lake, listen to me. We've got the house surrounded by police and federal officers. You can't escape. Come on with your hands up. Nothing yet, Jim. No. Well, let's give them a little time to make up their minds. Oh, I went through that second car they stole. Hmm? Find anything? Mm -hmm. Blood on the front seat. Hey, any guns? Nope. Mm -hmm. I'll give them one more call. Okay. One's freaking late. Listen to me. 
We've got the house surrounded by police and federal officers. You can't escape. Come out with your hands up. We'll have to move in, Bill. Signal the sergeant. Right. Okay, come on. Hold it, Bill. Okay. Now watch it. I'm going to kick the door in. Cover me. Right, Jim. Nobody in this room, Bill. That must be the door to the other room. Yeah, I guess so. Keep me covered. Right. Tommy Brunswick. He's the only one here. Is he dead? No, just passed out. Bill, look around the other room. See if you can find any lead on where Lake and that ex-doctor went. (laughs) Look, Doc. Doc, will you quit nipping at that point? You'll forget what you're supposed to do. My chore hardly demands the qualities of a genius. Well, let's go over it again, please. Oh, very well. I go into the Palace Hotel and give this note to the clerk. Yeah, the one named Joe. Exactly. He gives me Tommy's suitcase. I bring it back to the car, take the keys out of the suitcase, and we drive to the post office. Right. I go in, open Tommy's post office box with the keys, get the package, and come back to the car. Is that it? Yeah. Yeah. You still got the note Tommy wrote, ain't you? Yes, my ungrammatical friend, I have. Say, say, what do I get out of this whole thing? A year's supply of whiskey. <laughs> Very enticing. You know, uh, at first I felt badly about double-crossing Tommy this way. But upon mature deliberation, I think a year's supply of whiskey ought to salve my conscience. Until it disappears again. Brunswick, we know that Charlie Lake was here with you. Where did he go? I don't know. Where did he and the ex doctor leave? I couldn't say. We've already got the description of the car they're in, and we've sent out an alarm on it. Now, you might as well tell me what you know. Sorry, I'm not talking. What about that money you have hidden? Who told you about that? Frank Auburn. The other two are on their way now to get it, aren't they? I don't want to talk. Are you getting anywhere with him, Jim? No, not very far, Ben. I found this in the other room. Oh, what's that? A pad of prescription blanks. There's indented writing on the top sheet. Now, let's read it, see what it says. Huh? Yeah, go ahead. I'll hold the flashlight. Right. Put up a little bit. Yeah. That's it, Joe. Hold it. Yeah. Uh, dear Joe, please give the man who brings this note the black suitcase I left with you when I checked out. He is my friend. Any signature? Put it down. That, that's it. The well, signature's a little tougher to make out. Um, starts with a T. T. Tommy, it's the first name. Tommy Brunswick. I never wrote anything on that pad. Brunswick, who did you write this to? I never wrote it. We can find out if this is your handwriting. Hold it, Bill. I just remembered something. Let's go. I beg your pardon, sir. Are you the clerk? Yeah, sorry, we're all filled up, man. I have not come here to seek lodgings. Then what do you want? I seek a word with a clerk named Joe. I'm Joe. Splendid. What can I do for you? I am a messenger. I bring you this note. Okay, wait a minute. I got it in the office. I shall be standing here like the Sphinx, awaiting your return. <laughs> I think maybe the Sphinx needs a drink. <coughs> uh, that's better. Here you are, Mac. Well, well, thank you very much, sir. I've, uh, I've got it, Charlie. Nice work, Doc. Nice work. Don't bother getting back into the car, uh, Lake. Hey. I'll take that suitcase. And may I ask who you are, sir? Yes, I'm a special agent of the FBI. Huh? Oh, you can leave this car right here. I'll supply the transportation as far as headquarters. So, 
Charles Lake and Frank Auburn were found guilty of violating the National Motor Vehicle Theft Act and the Federal Escape Act and were sentenced to ten years each. Tommy Brunswick was turned over to local authorities. The bogus doctor was given a two-year sentence for harboring federal fugitives and treatment was designed to rehabilitate him. When Tommy Brunswick refused to answer any questions, Special Agent Taylor remembered that in his arrest record there was a notation which read, Place of Arrest, Lobby, Palace Hotel. The two special agents sped to the hotel and there they set up a surveillance covering both the front and side entrances with what results you have already seen. The final clue which led to the capture of Charlie Lake and the ex-doctor thus came from the trained memory of an FBI special agent. But this case would not have been closed as quickly had it not been for the close cooperation given the two special agents by the local police force. The same is true of a tremendous number of other cases which your FBI closes every week. The Federal Bureau of Investigation is proud of the fact that it makes its facilities available to every local law enforcement agency in the country. But it is even prouder of the fact that in every section of the country, the local police extend a cordial welcome to every special agent. We believe that to be true because in the past, such cooperation has inevitably led to victory over the criminal, to his arrest and conviction. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Now two final questions on the Equitable Society's Independent 60s plan. Are these plans flexible, Mr. Keating? Can the amount be increased if my income goes up in the next five years? It certainly can. Your equitable representative will tell you that many successful men have done exactly that. When I reach the age of 60, about how much income will I receive a month? Well, that's something you and your equitable representative will have to work out together. It depends on your present income and your future needs. At any rate, now's the time to act. Phone him soon. Or write a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. A gripping story of a midnight marauder. Its subject, homicide. Its title, Out of the Storm. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight's program was transcribed, and the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry D. Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. Others in the cast were... J.C. Flippin, Mark Lawrence, Wally Mayer, Charles Maxwell, Sidney Miller, and Steve Pendleton. This is Your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Out of the storm on This Is Your FBI. Stop, look, and listen if you drive a car. Safety first is better heated now than when it's too late. Observe the traffic rules and regulations in your locale. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. <laughs>